So I'll stay in the fellowship for a few minutes as the choir comes down. to 
Thank you to the choir and to the ensemble. What happens in August, camp meeting time is here, and uh, we'll begin the camp meeting for us here at Welcome Door on Sunday, August the 11th, that's just two weeks from today, Brother Joe Bryant from up in Kodak, Tennessee will be here preaching for us Sunday morning and Sunday night, and then we'll begin the camp meeting on Monday evening at 5.30 with supper, and we're looking forward to that good uh, that good opening night barbecue, amen? Say amen, Troll, you're cooking it, amen. I hope you, get, hope you get more excited about it than you are now, amen? <laughs> amen, and we're uh, looking forward to having a bunch of preachers come in. I've got uh, several, several motel rooms already booked, and men are excited about coming, and i got several up in the house this time. The, uh, the A.G. family won't be with us this year. Uh, Brother Jesse Butcher and his family will be here. They are Bluegrass Gospel, and they're local. They're from right up here in King, North Carolina. And uh, some of you may have heard Brother Jesse and his wife Dee and their boys sing. And uh, they're a real blessing. Jesse's a good preacher, too. He's a good evangelist. And so we look forward to having them with us uh, all during the uh, days of camp meeting. So that's August the 11th through the 14th. Now, on Tuesday and Wednesday, remember, we'll have morning services as well as evening services and uh, so we're looking forward to the, to the camp meeting. And we're looking forward to the, to the meals, the food. I've actually got camp meeting preachers that said, Preacher, I, I come to camp meeting so I can eat. And um, I've had others say, We come to camp meeting because y'all treat us like kings. Amen. And if there's, if, there's, if there's one thing among many, but if there's one thing my beloved predecessor taught this church, and that was take care of the men of God. And we really enjoy doing that and love doing that. And uh, we've, had a, we've had a bunch of uh, people come in uh, just in these last weeks. I've, I'm starting to feel like not only a pastor but an innkeeper. We've had so many requests, people coming in, staying in the prophet's room, staying in the mission house. And uh, we just are so happy that God has gave us those things in order to share with others, especially those in the ministry, the men of God. Uh, also, uh, got an announcement, Brother Troy uh, Sexton over here wants to meet with all the men right over here in this corner, immediately following the service this morning. If you're planning, men, if you're planning on coming Saturday uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, this coming Saturday at 8 o'clock, we're going to be having our annual work day, getting everything spruced up and ready for camp meeting. 
Uh, Brother Troy's got some things he needs to let us know about. So all the men that's planning on working Saturday meet right over here with Troy at the end of the service today. Also, um, I got a text just a moment ago. Actually, Sunday school had just started. And I got a text from Brother Roscoe Bowden. He said, I forgot to tell you. He said, I'm preaching this morning and tonight over at uh, New Hope. And so you uh, remember Brother Roscoe as he's away preaching and bless him and his family. And then don't forget to pray for him in the morning. Uh, he's having a procedure done over to Forsyth Hospital. Please remember to pray for him. All right. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Yes, Sister Catherine. Amen. It's good to have you back, Catherine. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Ezekiel. Let's go to the Old Testament this morning. And uh, my brother-in-law, Brother Denny, asked me, he said, what's the message about tomorrow? I said, I'm going to preach on the glory of God's grace. He said, you can pick about any book in the Bible and, and get that topic. I said, amen, you sure can. The grace of God is all through the Word of God. You know, sometimes we don't really appreciate the grace of God until we have to see what it's like to not have the grace of God. To be absent of the grace of God is a horrible condition. We were reminded of that this morning in our wonderful Sunday school lesson out of the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel on the sinner woman that came to Jesus in the house of the Pharisee and she anointed his feet with an ointment and then washed his feet with her tears and kissed his feet and uh, when the Pharisees started criticizing, Jesus reminded them uh, that since I've been here, you didn't anoint my head with oil, you didn't wash my feet, you've not kissed me, not one time. Yet she has not stopped since I came in, and she wasn't even invited to the dinner, she just came in. And so when Jesus forgave her of her sins, and the Bible specifically said that her sins were many. Uh, the Pharisees kind of started, uh, you know, if they had glasses on, they probably looked over their glasses like this and probably had a scowl on their face. And Jesus said, I want to ask you guys a question. He said, uh, if we got two men who owe a debt and one owes 50 pence and the other owes 500 pence and the master uh, who is they're indebted to chooses to forgive those debts he said which one do you think will be the more grateful and the more thankful and the Pharisee said well I suppose the one that was forgiven the most and Jesus said you've answered right We really don't understand the grace of God until we have experienced the grace of God. And we really don't appreciate the grace of God and what it means to us as the recipients of God's unmerited favor until we are shown something where the grace of God is absent. And it gets our attention. Such is the case in this text of Scripture that I'd like to read to you this morning from the 16th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. The 16th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. I'm going to begin our reading in verse number 1.
Oh, it's good to hear them pages turning. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse number 1. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, calls Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is in the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day when thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee to have compassion upon thee. But thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, Live, I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, Behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin and I girded thee about with fine linen and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. And thou... Thou, thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper in a kingdom. And thou renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord thy God. Now I'm going to stop reading there. Because in these verses, I find the subject for which I want to preach this morning that God has given us to preach. And I want to preach on the glory of God's grace. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word And we ask your blessing upon its preaching. I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit. I pray you'd fill me and anoint me, empower me through thy spirit to preach this portion of the scripture to this congregation. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll take your word and touch the hearts of these people. There may be someone here today, there may be multiple people here today who do not know you as their own personal Savior. They've never experienced the grace of God in their life. The unmerited, undeserved favor of God in their life. Lord, I know that according to your word, you desire to share your grace with these people. And Lord, I pray for those that are without you, that are without grace, that this morning 
They'll see their need for your grace and will come to the altar seeking to receive you as their own personal Savior. Speak to the hearts of each one here today according to your will. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and amen. So in the reality of this scripture, if I can put it that way, God is dealing with the city of Jerusalem. They have once again descended into idolatry and the Lord is trying to woo them back unto himself. If you read on through the rest of the 16th chapter, you'll really be able to see a a category list, if you will, of their great sin. But here in this portion of scripture that I read to you, he's trying to woo them back unto himself by reminding them of his great love and of all of the wonderful things that he has done for them, done in them, and done through them. This is a declaration of God's grace. In Ezekiel 16, on behalf of the people of Jerusalem. He reminds them that they were nothing when he found them. He reminds them that uh, by an illustration of a newborn baby that is unloved, that is unwanted, and is cast out into a field by its parents. God desires to show Jerusalem that they too were unloved, they too were unwanted, and they too were on the verge of death. But then Jesus came and He took them and He blessed them and He made them great among the cities of the world. His activity in the life of Jerusalem in this passage of Scripture can be summed up by only one word, grace. However, in this word that the Lord has for Jerusalem, He not only shows us a picture of grace, but He shows us a picture of grace as it's revealed in the lives of of all who place their faith in Him for salvation. We see not only the grace of God at work, but we see the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He reminds us in these verses, even back in the Old Testament, of what the Lord Jesus has done for us in going to that cross and being crucified and shedding His life's blood to pay for our sins. That's the only reason he went to the cross. He didn't go to pay his own sin. He had none. He he didn't even have a sin nature. But it was your sin and your sin and your sin and my sin that put Jesus on that cross. And he shows us his great love and his great mercy And His great grace that is extended to all of us when He went to the cross and died. And He shows us that in the story of this baby who is newborn and cast out into a field and left to die. Before I get into the few things that I want to bring to your attention I want to remind you a few things about the grace of God. The grace of God is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. The grace of God is God doing for you what He did not have to do. Grace is God doing for you what He chose to do because He has an everlasting love for you. Peter reminded us that God is long-suffering 
and not willing that any should perish. He doesn't desire any to go to hell. It is His will that all be saved. And so He sent His Son into this world uh, to die for the sins of the whole world that whosoever will can be saved. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your financial uh, outlook. It, it doesn't matter your educational level. None of those things matter. Jesus died for the souls of every man, woman, and child that ever walks upon the face of this earth. So grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God. And the Bible tells us that you're saved by grace. You're not saved by works. You're not saved by religion. You're not saved by anything but by that good grace of God extended to you on the cross of Calvary. For by grace are you saved through faith, the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. Hey, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And grace not only saves you, but the grace of God through the power of God is what keeps us saved. And Peter reminded us in 1 Peter 1, 5 that we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And grace is what helps you from day to day. The grace of God is what gets us through day by day. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? I'll take the grace of God over anything. But the grace of God not only saves you and keeps you saved and helps you through each and every day, but you are what you are by the grace of God. And that's what Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 10. But by the grace of God I am what I am and His grace was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. We're nothing without grace. Now in Ezekiel 16, in these 14 verses, I want to just bring three things quickly to your attention about the glory of God's grace. First of all, I want us to consider the wretched condition of one without grace, one without Christ. Secondly, I want to bring to our attention the wonderful compassion of Christ. Or we could say the wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all our sin. And lastly, I want to speak on the wondrous change that grace brings into the life of a believer. That wondrous change that Jesus Christ can only bring. Now look with me in the first five verses of our text this morning in Ezekiel chapter number 16. And the Lord lets us see the wretched condition of one without grace. Or we could say one without Christ. Notice with me in the first part of verse number 4. The Bible says, And as for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. We see here as a lost sinner, we are unclean. We are unacceptable in the eyes of God. Now I was in the delivery room for the birth of both of my children. And I wasn't in the delivery room when you all had your children. 
But in the delivery room where my two came into this world, it was a bloody mess. And, 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 when, and when my children uh, came into this world and drew their first breath and started crying, the first thing that they done with that newborn baby was not lay that baby in its mother's arms, nor did they hand that baby into his daddy's arms. The first thing they did the nurse that was there as soon as the doctor delivered that child in both instances there was a nurse there with a clean garment a clean blanket and uh, she said I'll be right back but before I can present your child to you I must clean this child up you see there's goop all in their nose they've been living in fluid for nine months they're a mess hey man they're about as bad as Jonah probably was, amen. And now they're in this brand new world and, and, and they, they've just entered into this world, but they're a mess. And the Bible tells us about that. The Bible tells us that they were, they were unclean. Their navel was not cut. Uh, they, the cord had not been cut. Can you imagine uh, hauling around a little baby with that cord and that afterbirth still hung on them? I mean, that's just gross beyond our imagination. But the Lord is saying unto Jerusalem, before I found you, before I saved you, that was the condition you were in. You were covered in your own filthy, r nasty blood and no one had washed you and no one had cleaned you. And my friend, as an unregenerate uh, a sinner, this, this unsaved has never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. We are filthy and dirty and covered in the mire and the blood and the muck and the dirt of this world's sins upon our life and we're not fit to be presented unto the Lord in that condition. He said as sinners were unclean he also said you've not been washed in water to supple thee. That means, that tells us that as lost sinners, not only were we unclean, but we were uncared for. There was no one to wash us. There was no one to supple us. There, there was no one to care for us. And as a lost sinner, I want you to know you're covered in your sin. And I want you to know that in this world, there are no people that care for us. There's no one that cares for the lost sinner. The Lord gave us the parable of the Good Samaritan to show us how people will go out of their way to avoid one that needs help. And it's the same way in, in, in mankind today. Not only were we unclean and uncared for, but in verse number 4, he says that uh, uh, thou wast not salted at all. And thou wast not swaddled at all not only are we unclean as sinners not only are we uncared for as sinners but we're unclothed and we are unclaimed as a matter of fact without Christ we're the very enemy of God and you heard the choir sing while ago it is finished well, there was a battle, there was a war that took place on Calvary's Hill that day. The war between God and the war between God and, and between Satan and the forces of evil and the forces of God came together and they met in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I'll take all the sin of the world. I'll take all the sin of every lost person in my own body. And for six hours he hung there and God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him had not Christ died on that cross we would all be lost and we'd all be hopeless and we'd all be helpless but thank God that Jesus died on that cross that's the wretched condition and in verse 5 he says none I pity thee to do any of these things unto thee to have compassion upon thee but thou was cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou was born. The Lord's trying to get us to see 
the horrible, criminal, uncaring event of the birth of a child. The cord is not cut. The afterbirth is delivered. The child is not washed. The child is not cuddled. The child is not clothed. The child is not cared for. Yet the child was just cast out into an open field to die and to be food for the buzzards. That's the condition of one in the eyes of God that is without Christ and still in their sin. But beginning in verse number 6, I want you to notice down through verse number 9 the wonderful compassion of grace. The wonderful compassion of Christ. The first thing that always amazes me about my salvation is that I didn't have to go to God. He came to me. Why did God come to where I was? Because I could not go to where He was. I was laying flat on my back, unloved, uncared for, uncleaned, unclothed. I could not make my way to God, no matter how hard I may have tried. And yet people today are trying their very best to get to God on their own by coming to church, by owning a Bible, by putting money in the plate, by living a good life, by being a good neighbor, by being a good employee. And they're trying to do all of these good works and all of those good works are good, but they ain't good enough. We must be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we find here, first of all, that the wonderful compassion of Christ in His marvelous grace, He came to where we were. He said in verse 6, And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, He came to where we were. I remember the night He passed by my way, on my knees by my bed at my home up the road. I remember my dad on his knees beside of me with his Bible opened up to John 10.10 10 and explaining to me that the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy and that he said that's the devil and you're already owned by him but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly and he explained that was Jesus Christ and how Jesus loved me and died for me on the cross and I'm so glad he came by my way that night because I called on his name and I ask Him to forgive me of my sin and I ask Him to come into my heart and save me and I ain't been lost a second since. Praise His holy name. I'm glad He came to where I was. But you know what? When He came where I was and when He saw my condition and when He heard my cry, He commanded me to live. No longer dead in my sins and my trespasses. They were all forgiven. They were all gone. And the Bible says in verse 6, and he says, And unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, I said, Live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, Live. And I want to tell you something, when I bowed my head and asked the Lord to have mercy upon me and cleanse me of my sin and forgive me of my sin and save my soul, He said, live, you who were dead are now alive in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The wonderful grace of Jesus, He came to where I was and He commanded me to live. And in verse number 8, the Bible said He had compassion on me. And he says, and when I passed by thee and looked upon thee. When I passed by thee and I looked upon thee, he gave me some compassion. You've done that before. You know what? You've done that to an animal before. You've seen an old dog or old cat or what have you. Something's wrong with that thing. Something's been in a fight. And it comes to you, and you could just say, go on, I don't have time for you. 
But you show that old dog a little compassion, don't you? Rub him on his head and hold him in your arms a little bit. Show a little compassion to him. Just an animal, but you know how to show compassion. Oh, listen, when the Lord come and saw us in our condition, boy, we weren't worthy of his time or his attention, filthy, dirty in the sins of this world, but he showed us some compassion. And he gave us some of his time, and I'm so glad that he did. And the Bible says in verse 8 that when he passed by and he looked upon me, he showed me some compassion. He said, Behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. He's covered me with himself. You say, how are you covered with Jesus? What does it mean to be covered by his blood? Well, I'll tell you what it means. I just quoted it to you a while ago from 2 Corinthians 5, 21. But he hath made him to become sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When we bow our knees and ask the Lord to have mercy upon us, amen, he washes us in the blood of Christ and then he clothes us in a pure, white, clean robe of righteousness. And when God looks down upon us, he doesn't see our sin anymore. They're all gone as far as he's concerned. And all he sees is the blood of his son covering us in the white robe of righteousness. Hallelujah. I'm glad I'm covered today in the blood of Jesus Christ he came to where I was he commanded me to live he had compassion on me and he covered me and he made a covenant with me he made a covenant with me he says yea I swear unto thee the last part of verse 8 yea I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee saith the Lord God and thou became mine Thou becamest mine. People, religious people run around here today and say, you can lose your salvation if you don't act right and live right. I don't understand where they get that from other than a misinterpretation of the scriptures. Because Jesus himself said in John chapter number 10 and verses 28 and 29, He said, I know my sheep and they know me. And he said, my Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man shall be able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. How in the world can you lose something when you're safe and secure in the Father's hand? He made a covenant with me that I'll never be lost. Verse 9, he cleansed us and then he consecrated us. But lastly, and I'm done. In the last verses of this text, verses 10 to 14, we see the wondrous change that grace brings. The wondrous change that Christ brings into our life that only he can bring. Let's take just a moment before we consider these verses and let's remember what we were. We think we're something. We think we're somebody. No. Go out to the field again and see the newborn screaming to the top of its lungs for someone to come and to clean it, and to care for it, and to love it. But it finds nothing. No one passes by that way. And that child was left for dead, covered in its blood. That's what you were. Without Christ... That's what you are. But thank God Jesus passed by. And he looked upon that one and he heard that cry for help and for mercy and he looks down upon us undeserving but yet recipients of his grace and he says live. 
Now look at what we are. We're clothed. He said, I clothe thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin and I girded thee about with fine linen and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thou wast decked with gold and silver and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work that thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil and thou wast exceeding beautiful and thou didst prosper in a kingdom and thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty for it was perfect through my comeliness which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. Here we find that we are clothed we are crowned and we are become comely. We are become the ornaments and the honor of Him. But there's one thing I want you to see that's the greatest thing about grace. These garments, these, this crown, this comeliness, this appearance, these are not the garments of slaves. These are not the garments of servants in the master's house. These are the garments of the child of the king. Do you remember in the parable of the prodigal son, the prodigal was so filthy and so covered with the world that he said, I'm going home to the father, but I'm not going to be asked to be placed as a son. I'm just going to ask him to be, let me be a servant. And when the father saw him, he didn't wait for the son to come to him. He went to where the son was. And he didn't say bring the paddle and bring the servant's garments and tidy up the servants' quarters, he said, bring me a ring and give me shoes to put on his feet and a robe upon him. And he said, I want us to make merry because this, my son, is found. The greatest thing about the grace of God is you're no longer the enemy. You're no longer the slave. You are the son. The Lord has taken a bunch of unwanted and unloved people and He saved them by His marvelous grace and He's put them on display to show the rest of the world, hey, this is what my grace can do for you. I don't know where you are in Ezekiel 16. You may still be the baby laying out in the field waiting for somebody to come along and to show you some compassion and love. If you are, I want you to know you can be saved this morning. You can come and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll forgive you. He'll wash every sin in your life away from you. And just like he said to the baby in that field when he's talking to Jerusalem, he says, live. He'll say to you, live, and you'll be a new creature in Jesus Christ. You just got to trust him and come. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer this morning. Our musician, our song leader are coming and they're going to have a, word, um, a number of invitation for us. We're opening the altars this morning for one and all. Whatever the need of your heart is, you come this morning. If you need to be saved, you come. We'll be more than happy to pray with you, show you how to be born again. If there's a need in your heart, child of God, you come. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing upon this message. We pray, Holy Spirit, you have touched the hearts of those that needed touching this morning. And I pray, dear Lord, that each one will mind you, dear Lord, and respond to your wooing and to your calling them unto yourself. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.